Evening everybody. 2 Timothy again tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I was wondering the way up the road was anybody going to be here tonight because it was sort of looking like a night for the port or something. And then it started raining and it was a night for the ducks. So I thought well maybe somebody will come out. But it's good to see you and for making this a priority in your week. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we've been slowly making our way through 2 Timothy. Paul's final farewell letter. His final divinely inspired words to Timothy and indeed to us in the church dispensation and remember Paul is locked up he's in the Mamertine prison in Rome he's awaiting the executioner's axe to take him from earth to glory and he has some final very personal but very poignant words for his young spiritual son in the faith Timothy and over the last two weeks we've learned that Timothy he was despondent he was timid as a result of many external factors but Paul wrote to him in chapter 1 and of 2 Timothy and he gave him some wonderful exhortations that we should all put in place in our own lives. And I suppose over chapter 1 you could write this title, Get Going for God and Guard the Gospel. Those were Timothy's two primary duties and we finished up last week by thinking of those two characters, Phygelus and Hermogenes, who were desert- deserters of the faith. And then he pointed to that example on Isiphorus who was his friend, his loyal friend, who wasn't ashamed of him, or indeed the gospel. And now we come to chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. We'll end at verse 7. And we'll come before the Lord just very quickly and ask for his blessing upon the reading of his word. Our Father and our God, we thank you for another opportunity to gather around your word with your people. And Father, we do pray tonight that you would give us understanding. That you would give us that divine illumination that can only come from God above. We realize, Father, that we need thee. And we do pray to that end that you will help the preacher and the hearer alike. Blot out every distraction and may this time be profitable for all of us. And may we just be still in your presence and know that thou art God. So do us good Lord we pray these things in the Saviour's name. Amen. On Christmas Eve in 1866 a little baby girl was born in New Jersey by the name of Annie Johnson. Nearly three years later, all that joy from Christmas had dissipated into floods of sorrow as Annie's mother passed away just at the tender age of 23. Two years later, her father also died, leaving her and her younger sister as orphans. But at the age of eight, she was gloriously saved whenever an evangelistic campaign came to her hometown. And although her life was transformed by the power of God, her external circumstances, they didn't really change much. Her own health deteriorated very young in life and the doctors told her that she would soon be an invalid, she'd be crippled by arthritic pain and that her life expectancy wouldn't be terribly long. In all of her sadness and illness and even in her financial predicament, she cast herself upon the grace of God and that was her portion and she wrote these words, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labours increase. To added affliction he added his mercy. To multiply trials his multiplied peace. In the midst of her circumstances Annie Johnson wrote those words filled with the strength of the grace of God. Paul wanted to tell Timothy something very similar in verse 1 where we finished up last week. And I wonder this week during the week have you known the grace of God in your life? Since last Tuesday night, have you gone through that the week very conscious of not only the saving grace that saves us, but the sustaining grace in the everyday trials of life? For that's what we're here to do tonight, to to get a message that is practical from the word of God and to apply that word to our lives with the Spirit's help 
for our individual daily lives. So Timothy, he, or Paul encouraged Timothy last week that he was to have that grace to carry on in verse 1. And now Paul turns to verse 2 and he starts to speak to Timothy about faithfulness and purity. And he outlines six key elements which are key to Timothy for a pastor or an elder, a deacon or a member or indeed every Christian and indeed for us tonight. We're not going to get through six of them. I've tried to get through three but we'll see how we go. I want you to notice first of all that Timothy, he's to be a steward. Now whenever we talk about stewardship or whenever it's mentioned, especially when it comes to the Bible, I tend to think of it about, you know, those teachings about stewardship of our time and our resources and our money. And of course we could go through many examples in scripture to look at stewardship. Reminds me though of a pastor who had preached on stewardship and tithing on a Sunday morning and one of his congregation rang the church office on the Monday morning and he asked to speak to the head hog of the trough. The secretary was taken aback and she asked, who? The man replied, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. Sure that she had heard that right, she said to him, Sir, if you mean our pastor, you'll have to treat him with much more respect than that. You'll have to ask for the pastor. You can't refer to them as the head hog of the trough. Well, said the man, of ten grand that I'm thinking of dedicating to the building fund. The secretary said, well, oh sir, I think the big pig has just walked in through the door. Now don't you be calling your new pastor the head hog of the trough or anything like that. But whenever we come to Paul's letter to Timothy, we're not referring to stewardship in terms of money or anything like that. It's stewardship of a much more precious possession or a much more precious thing. It's stewardship of the gospel. Look at verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now Paul and Timothy, they'd been on many ex missionary expeditions through Troas and Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, among other places, before Timothy finally settled down to be the pastor at Ephesus. But he would have heard firsthand those mighty sermons that the Apostle of Paul had preached and taught in those various cities and I imagine whenever they were traveling through those various cities Paul would have poured out his theological mind to Timothy on those roads and he would have just soaked it all up like a sponge. Of course Paul was one of the finest scholars of Judaism. He had been educated at the feet of Gamaliel. He would have been an expert in the Old Testament scriptures but now the light of the glorious gospel has shone into his life and thrilled his soul. And that knowledge of the Old Testament has been transformed by the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it has now completely refined his Jewish beliefs. He was able to piece all those pieces of the jigsaw together as he saw those Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that knowledge was being poured just into young Timothy. But John MacArthur reckons that it wasn't just a straight gospel message here that Paul is speaking to Timothy of. It's more likely to be sort of a, a systematic theology, if you like. And it traced the great biblical doctrines right from Genesis even into the early New Testament. And Paul would have questioned, I suppose, Peter, James and John and those other notable disciples regarding the details of the life of Jesus Christ. Those first hand accounts and Paul would have told all that to Timothy and Paul says you've heard this from my mouth Timothy. But look again thou hast heard of me, thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Remember Luke and Silas and Barnabas and many others were there with them in those early days whenever Paul was instructing them. And they also had input into the teaching of young Timothy. But not only that, it's been witnessed by crowds, small and great. And Timothy, you have a responsibility to remember those things which I have told you. But not only have you a responsibility to remember the things that I have told you, you have also a responsibility to reproduce these things in faithful men. Look at the second half of the verse. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That word commit simply means to deposit. 
gives you that idea of putting your money into the bank for safekeeping, or I don't even know whether that's a good thing to do anymore, but that's the idea here, and that's what Paul was doing. He's depositing a priceless treasure of gospel truth that he had received from God, and now Paul's committing it to Timothy. And look again, because Timothy was to commit it to others. What Paul had been to Timothy, Timothy was to be to others by extension. The same commit thou to faithful men. And then, not only by extension, but by example, he says, who shall be able to teach others also. Isn't that the example of the Lord Jesus? You remember how he chose the twelve out from among the disciples? We've seen that in, in week one, whom he called apostles. But he poured his life into those dozen men. He taught them the scriptures. He taught them by his example. And those men were filled by the Holy Spirit of God. And they turned the world upside down. But what did they do? They poured themselves into others. And that's how the church grew. And those faithful men entrusted the unadulterated gospel message into the hands of others. That's the same formula for church growth today. That's the same formula that Paul followed and exhorted Timothy to follow as well. There were no gimmicks here or clever tricks. It was just pass on the truth, Timothy, and the truth that God has entrusted me with, I'm entrusting you with, and you entrust it to the other faithful men to teach others also. But look at the prerequisite for the people that Timothy was to teach. It was faithful men. It wasn't just anybody that showed up. It was faithful men. Men who had been regenerated by the word of God and the spirit of God. Men that had proven themselves to be reliable and faithful to the cause of Christ. And to the church of Christ and indeed to the servants of Christ. Faithful men and Timothy was to be a steward of the word of God. And Paul writes this verse in a way that puts an image in my mind of a relay race. Because you see the four stages in this handing off of the truth of the baton to to Timothy that Paul envisages. It's from Christ to Paul, Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, from faithful men to others. Incidentally, that's the same pattern today. And I don't know what it's like in Ballyclare, but by and large in the local church, we're not very good at it. We palm it off sometimes and say, well, that's what Bible colleges are for. That's what formal education is for. And whilst there's nothing wrong with college education, the primary place for teaching and entrusting the message of the gospel and the unsearchable riches of Christ is in the local church. Where faithful men disciple younger men in the faith. And that younger man, he goes and finds someone younger than him in the faith and he disciples them. It goes on and on. They entrust the message of the truth and that's how the church flourishes. With the members then exercising and honing their gifts within the local church. But I wonder, some of the older saints tonight, do you realize how much experience and knowledge that you're sitting on? You're sitting on a gold mine, and what good is it if you just keep it to yourself? Let me encourage you to pick out a younger man in the church that you can personally disciple take him for a coffee or invite him to your tea and just pour yourself into that young man's life and take him under your wing young man seek out someone who's been on the road of faith longer than you a godly person and just sit and absorb his knowledge and follow his example and use everything you learn from him to the glory of of God, And then pick out someone younger than yourself in the faith, maybe a new believer, and draw alongside them so that they'll be able to teach others also. And ladies, if you think you're getting away easy tonight, that's your responsibility too. To find a younger lady in the assembly and to teach them the truths of scripture that they might not just understand. Teach them how to be that Proverbs 31 woman. Why it's necessary to have their head covered coming to worship. Tell them their experience, your experiences of how Christ has made you into the woman you are today. You know, we can't expect them to know everything unless we teach them. Wonder you a good faithful steward tonight. Elders, deacons tonight, is that not our responsibility more than any? For as James said, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Have we kept the faith? Have we passed it on in its undiluted form to the next generation? 
Paul exhorted Timothy to be a good steward. But notice again in verse 3 and 4, he, not- he tells Timothy to be a good soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. As Paul lay in that dark, dank prison cell in Rome, he had plenty of time to study these Roman soldiers which were on duty. And history tells us that the Roman soldiers of that day were the toughest, most disciplined and most effective soldiers in the whole wide world. And Paul would have got to know these these soldiers and he started to observe their rigorous duties. And it reminded Paul that Timothy, and indeed every Christian, is to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Of course, he was enlisted as a soldier of Christ's army whenever he was converted the moment he accepted Christ as Savior. But then Timothy was commissioned back in Acts 16, verse 3, whenever Paul It chose him to go on a missionary journey with him. And Luke records in Acts 16.3 saying him would Paul have to go forth with him. Whenever Paul said about go forth, it's literally translated to take as the field, to take to the field as a soldier. And so Timothy, he's enlisted, he's commissioned to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And a good soldier doesn't quit just because they face a difficult task ahead or a dangerous situation. In fact, of course, that's what they sign up to. And they know if they must, if necessary, they must lay down their life for their country or their army or their regiment that they represent. And Timothy was to endure hardness, or in other words, to suffer evil, trouble, or affliction. For when God calls us to himself as soldiers, he calls us to engage in the battle. A battle that is lifelong that doesn't end until we reach home. Of course, God doesn't hand out brochures for the Christian life with a whole lot of fringe benefits to to those that become Christians. Remember what he said, though. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. There's a cross to bear. There's a a cost to pay. And the day and hour that you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, we entered into the battlefield. wonder do you realize tonight that we're in a battle. It's not a physical battle, of course, but a spiritual battle against sin and against Satan and the powers of darkness. And even right now in, in the meeting and as we come to prayer, there's a spiritual battle going on. And Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sounds serious, doesn't it? But don't worry, Christian, because he's given us the necessary resources to fight that battle. Because he gives us the whole armor of God. And you know what? The battle's already been won for us. As we thought about on Easter Sunday, the tomb is empty, sin is defeated, hell is defeated and Christ reigns. Sometimes we forget that we're in the battle. We think sometimes that the Christian life is a cruise ship heading to heaven and we'll we'll face no enemies, no affliction, no attacks. But biblical Christianity is a battleship, It's it's a warship. And we're good soldiers manning the ship tonight. And as a soldier, Paul exhorts Timothy to be a good soldier because a good soldier has endurance but he also tells Timothy to be a good soldier without any entanglements if we look at the beginning of verse 4 no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life to be entangled is really to be distracted and when as ordinary citizens tonight of the United Kingdom we're relatively free agents we can make our own decisions by and large we can become involved in sports clubs and political organizations, if that foot floats your boat, and whatever else you want to do. But as a soldier, you can't entangle yourself with anything that will interfere or distract you from duty or from your post. A soldier's not free to go where he likes, especially whenever the army is in battle. He can't just decide, well, I'm going to take a lie in tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not going to fight. Of course, he's answerable to his officer and ultimately his commander-in-chief. 
General Douglas MacArthur was an American war hero who was remembered for pledging to the people of the Philippines whenever the Japanese invaded their country. He said, I shall return. And at the end of World War II, he accepted the surrender of the Japanese on board the American flagship. But he was also commander of the United Nations troops in the Korean War. And after that, he was a very decorated veteran and very highly respected. That was until he started to entangle himself in politics. And he was fired by President Harry Truman after he attempted to defy Truman's foreign policy. Timothy was to stay clear here from anything that would entangle him to the affairs of this life. He wasn't to get caught up in these social causes because God's purposes are spiritual, not social. He wasn't to get, up, to get caught up with politics because you can't solve spiritual problems with political remedies and preachers across our problems ought to remind themselves of that. Timothy wasn't to get distracted from the call of God in his life to be a preacher of the word. And Timothy, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, well, all these other things will be added on to you. And if you track the blessing of revival in our own country and across the world, you'll notice that when people are saved from sin, that's whenever social and political reform take place. And it's the man of God's duty to preach the word, to stay loyal to the gospel, to fight the good fight, and God will take care of the rest. Timothy, don't have entanglements, but why are you to endure and why are you not to have these entanglements? Well, look at the desire of a good soldier at the end of the verse. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. Chosen in that verse, it literally means again to enlist. And who enlists Paul into the ministry of being an apostle? We've seen in week one that it was by the will of God. And God had called Timothy to the ministry of an elder or teacher in Ephesus. And Paul reminds Timothy that his one goal is to please the Lord and to bring glory to the Lord. Be wonderful to bring, to be pleasing to the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? And to the elders at Ephesus and to the church at Ephesus. But Timothy, it's not, it's not about them. It's not about building a ministry from yourself. It's not about the crowd that you're getting in on a Sunday. The size of your membership role or anything like that. The goal is... The desire is to please God. And how do you do it? By faithfulness. By not getting distracted, by enduring well. Do you remember another man in the Bible who God said he was pleased with? It was Enoch. He lived in a wicked and sinful generation and God raptured him. And Hebrews 11 verse 5 in that hall of faith says, For before his translation or his rapture, he obtained this testimony that he pleased God. That he pleased God. Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony to be written over our lives? He or she pleased God. Not that they pleased anybody else. That we pleased God. May that be our goal in everything that we do. So Timothy was to be a steward. He was to be a soldier. But look in closing with me at verses 5 through 7. Because Timothy's told to be a success. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Paul now changes the imagery here from the army barracks or the battlefield to the athletic arena. Of course, the apostle Paul, he used that metaphor of the athlete describing the Christian and the race to be the Christian life so many times. And one of those texts that stand out to me is Philippians chapter 3. Whenever Paul spoke about following after and reaching forth and pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All those little phrases there, it states what the athlete does. Striving with all their might to get that victor's wreath or the crown and to be put in that winner's stand in that day and be presented with the crown. It's the same idea here in verse 5 of our text this evening. Whenever Paul says to strive for masteries. It comes from a Greek word that gives us our English word athlete or athletics. And John Phillips the commentator reckons that Paul probably had in mind here. Wrestling or boxing events that were popular 
in the Greek arena. And don't get the wrong idea here. They weren't wrestlers like those big sumo wrestlers that you see on TV sometimes. These were fit, hardened fighters. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you're already in the ring. It's too late to back out. You have to fight or you'll be shown up to be a coward and covered with shame. So Timothy, strive for mastery. Strive for that crown. Of course, that's the aim of every athlete whenever they go to the Olympic Games, isn't it? To win the race, to beat the record, to be hailed as the hero. To have their national anthem of their country just ringing in their ears. But it doesn't happen without hard work. A dedicated life, single-minded vision. And training for those Greek Olympics, it was a very serious business. Those athletes were training from 10 months before the actual contest. They were removed from their everyday life. They were put on a rigid, a rigid diet and they exercised diligently to build up their strength and endurance for the games. There was sacrifice involved and total dedication. But isn't that the same with the Christian life? There's sacrifices to be made. Sometimes it costs us those things that we want to hold on so dearly. Sometimes it's friends or time or relationships, money, career. But ask the athlete that has been crowned as a winner with the victor's wreath on their head after winning the race. Was the sacrifice all worthwhile? They'll say a thousand times yes. Some gold medal made by a man is worth that sacrifice. What sacrifice is too much for our saviour? To hear him say, well done thy good and faithful servant. What sacrifice would be too great to receive those crowns that are available? Paul doesn't mention what crowns are available, but he does in other parts of scripture. There's the soul winner's crown in 1 Thessalonians 2. There's the crown of life, James 1. There's the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4 and 8. There's the crown of glory, 1 Peter 5. There's an incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians 9. There's crowns to be won. You know, friends, one day you and I will have to stand before that judgment seat of Christ. The word for judgment seat, it's, it's bima. It's the very same word used to describe where those Olympic judges give out the prizes. It's differentiated, of course, from the great white throne judgment that's described in Revelation 20. That's the judgment of the unsaved. But this bema seat, that's where we will give an account for our, our works, our services rendered in the flesh. And prize day is coming. And I wonder are we looking forward to it? Will we be people that stand before the Lord in that day with eternity's values in view? As people that have striven for perfection? Or will we be ashamed on that day? Timothy was to strive to be successful. But look at the end of verse 5 because he was to strive lawfully. The athlete of course has to play by the rules. Otherwise all that training and all that effort... They'd just be disqualified if they broke the rules. And Paul tells Timothy, you too have to abide by the rules of the Christian conduct. You ought to be Christ-like. You mustn't strive by the flesh, but in the power and in the energy of the Holy Spirit. But not only does Timothy have to be a successful athlete, he has to be a successful farmer. Look at verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of of the fruits. I wonder do you know any successful farmers? Whenever I speak to farmers, see them at Balmar's show and whatnot, and whenever the milk price is good, the farmers are poor, and whenever the milk price is bad, farmers are poor. But you see, the farmer has a very tough job to keep us all fed. He walks long, diligent hours, he follows the rules of nature, and he knows that there's a time to plough and to plant and to cultivate and then to reap the harvest at a certain time of the year. And if he doesn't follow that pattern, he'll never taste the first fruits of the labor. And of course, in Paul's day, there were no fine New Hollands or combine harvesters like we have today. All the work had to be done by hand. And the farmer was up at sunrise and he would have labored all day until the sun set. And Paul reminds Timothy here, Timothy, you have to put your hand to the ply. You have to toil, you have to sow the good seed of the gospel and to do it diligently but also with patience. For after the toil comes triumph. Because look he must be first partaker of the fruits. That's the very biblical principle here of labor and then reward. And the two go hand in hand. And I don't know maybe Timothy wasn't seeing much reward for his labors immediately. 
But he had to have patience. He wasn't to be discouraged if the harvest failed to come to pass immediately. Do you recall the words of James? He said, be patient therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. You know, friends, tonight, you and I might not see the fruits of our labors immediately. And it's so easy to get discouraged in the work of the Lord because it doesn't seem like we're getting immediate fruit to pick. And you're maybe ready to pack it in tonight and you're ready to write the resignation letter. Let me encourage you to be like the farmer. To keep behind the plough, to keep cutting straight and trusting that God will give the increase. And you and I might not even see the impact of our ministries until that full harvest has been realised. Until the full feast is spread out in the crowning day that's coming by and by. And Paul says to Timothy in verse 7. Consider what I say. Consider those illustrations that I've given you in verses 2 through 6. Consider the role of a steward and a soldier and a success. And Timothy with the Lord's help be all that God wants you to be. Timothy had an unparalleled opportunity here. He was a young man who was in a church in one of the major locations. But he was overwhelmed. And Paul has given him a guidebook here to success. God had entrusted him with the gift of being a teacher or an elder or a pastor. He had given him the truth of the gospel. And a tremendous outpost. Ephesus was one of the main thoroughfares of that day where he could preach the gospel from. Paul just prays here that God would open his eyes. And that he would see what's directly in front of him. And that God would give him an understanding of all those things. wonder tonight is your prayer that God would open your eyes and, and my eyes to see what's in front of us. That he would give us understanding of all that he wants you and I to be. Even in Ballyclare in these days that lie ahead as you enter into a new exciting chapter in the life of your church. That God would make you a good steward of the gospel. That he'll give you God-given opportunities to share the good news of the gospel with all that you come into contact with. That he give you that older saint or that younger man in Christ to disciple and to mentor. That you'll be a good soldier of Christ and that he'll make you a success and that he'll bestow the showers of blessing on your life. Personally, yes. Individually, yes. But as a church in the days that lie ahead. May God bless his word to our hearts tonight. Thanks.